So Welcome to session 44, where we're going to discuss the oral cavity in the online anatomy review. Let's start with a question. A 52-year-old man is brought to the emergency department because of a suprahyoid stab that has extended from one side of the neck to the other. When asked to protrude the tongue, the result is seen in the accompanying image. The injury most likely involves which of the following nerves? The answer would be the left hypoglossal. And you can see that what is happening with the cranial nerve 12 denervation is that you end up licking your lesion, which causes the tongue to curl to the side that is injured. If you were looking at injuring the right hypoglossal, it would go the, to the right side. The left vagus um, would have to cut the carotid sheath, and the right glossopharyngeal is too deep to be cut from the anterior surface wounds in the neck. So what kind of areas do we want to be concerned of with the oral cavity? Well, there's the vestibule, which is going to be between the teeth and the lips, and that'll involve the cheek area. There's the oral cavity proper, which is bounded uh, anteriorly by the teeth and the gums. The roof will be the hard and soft palate, and the floor will be the anterior two-thirds of the tongue and the paralingual spaces on either side. This will communicate posteriorly with the oropharynx by passing through the palatoglossal folds. Of course, the teeth are going to be anchored individually in the sockets through the um, gomphosis ligaments, or the gomphosis uh, joints and the periodontal ligaments will anchor it into the gomphosis sockets. This includes the two incisors, one canine on each side, two premolars on each side, and three molars in each of the areas of the adult jaw, which can be divided up into quadrants. In people that have lost their teeth or become edentulous, um, the alveolar processes within the jaw will be resorbed. Here you can see an image that divides up the different components of the oral cavity. By looking under the tongue you can see a frenulum and off to either side you can see the faint blue of the lingual vein and the fimbriated folds of the um, sublingual papilla which is going to open up the submandibular duct into the uh, oral cavity proper, and you can see the teeth and the lips, which the vestibule would be the space in between those, and the oral cavity proper is behind the teeth. When we look into the palate regions, you can see a hard and a soft palate, and off of the posteriorly located soft palate, you have the uvula, and along the mucosa, you'll have glandular tissue, which is why it needs parasympathetic supply to this area. Coming forward for the greater palatine canal is going to be the greater palatine nerves and arteries, and going backwards onto the soft palate will be the lesser palatine nerves and arteries. These will meet up with the nasopalatine nerves that are coming from the nasal cavity uh, through the incisive foramen in the midline of the hard palate. In the paralingual areas, you can see that the tongue is going to be uh, composed of two main portions. It will have eight muscles on either side, but they'll be divided up into four intrinsics, which change the shape of the tongue, and four extrinsic muscles, which change the positioning of the tongue. All of them are innervated by cranial nerve 12. Coming off of the palate, we have two muscles, the palatoglossus, which will go up towards the palate from the tongue, and the palatopharyngeus, which will form the posterior pillars and go back to the pharynx. Notice how all of the vascular and nervous structures running in the paralingual space are running outside of that hyoglossus muscle. And the lingual nerve will be one of the structures that goes around and gets into the tongue itself, unlike the submandibular duct, 
which will be running off of the submandibular gland and arching around to get in by the frenulum. Therefore, the nerves and arteries do go to the tongue, but ducts do not. You can see how the lingual artery gets deep to the hyoglossus muscle and then will distribute into the tongue to become a deep vessel of the tongue and a dorsal vessel of the tongue. Let's talk for a few moments about deglutition and dysphagia. Dysphagia is going to be difficulty or pain while swallowing, and deglutition is the act of swallowing. It's initiated voluntarily, but is completed by reflex. Therefore, both afferent and efferent innervation have to be intact for normal swallowing to occur. The afferent innervation of the mucosa of the posterior tongue and the oropharynx is coming from the glossopharyngeal nerve. This only does one muscle that we'll discuss a little bit later. The efferent information uh, and innervation to the soft palate is being carried by the vagus nerve. This is all going to mix, be mixed up into a pharyngeal plexus of both glossopharyngeal and vagus contributions. If there's a pharyngeal neoplasm, um, this can irritate cranial nerve 9 and 10, and there'll be pain that occurs when it's swallowed. Um, this can sometimes refer to the ear because both cranial nerve 9 and 10 contribute to the ear canal. Dysphagia, which is going to be the act of uh, painful swallowing, may have many, many causes ranging from central nervous system injuries to the peripheral injuries associated with cranial nerve 10 and 12. When the vagus nerve is damaged, the uvula deviates away from the site of injury. By getting someone to say, ah, you can test this. When the hypoglossal nerve is damaged, it's going to go towards the site of lesion in which you lick your lesion. Let's try another question. A 70-year-old man has a biopsy of a growth on his lower lip. The biopsy reveals a squamous cell carcinoma. Which lymph node will most likely be the sentinel node in the spread of this aggressive cancer? When you look at where this is, it's more anterior and on the lip. So it's a very anteriorly placed anatomical structure. And it's going to drain, of course, by gravity and into the closest possible opportunity of getting into a node. Now, there's really only two different divisions of the nodes, which we'll extrapolate on in a second. But if you're going to be near the chin, there's got to be a good reason that you would go somewhere other than the submental, which is going to be the answer. We'll look at these other ones in this vision of the lymphatics of the head and neck. What you can see here is that there's a couple branches or nodes that will distribute on the face with the parotid and the buccal regions. But for the most part, they circle the head at the base of the, the um, skull and across the chin, which is called the set of collar nodes. And they make a ring around the external head. Because lymphatics of the head and neck are not needed in the deep cranial vault regions. They're only needed in the head. And of course, deep and superficial nodes will be present in the neck. So these collar nodes will have things like the submental, submandibular, superficial cervical, mastoid, and occipital branches and nodes. Since the lip is closest to the submental, that would be the likely site of the um, sentinel nodes which would light up. There are two really important nodes in the neck that you should know. The jugulodigastric, which will receive things from the deep neck and the more posterior head. Um, this will drain and oftentimes become inflamed when somebody has an infection. When somebody has a pericarditis, it's always good to see if there is an inflammation of the jugulodigastric to ensure that um, this might not be draining down from the buccopharyngeal regions. Also, a little bit lower down, there's a jugulo-omohyoid node. And this node will light up often as the sentinel node uh, for all of the things that are more anterior in the neck or um, a little bit lower down. 
Sometimes this can be called the actual sentinel node of Virchow, not to be confused with the pathological idea of a sentinel node. Moving on to the deeper structures, you can see the positioning of the jugular digastric and the jugular omohyoids. And in relationship to the tongue, the posterior structures and the retropharyngeal structures will get to the jugular digastric whereas the more anterior structures will um, drain down and get into the jugular omohyoid. Also, they'll be draining the neck and the larynx, so any infections there may show up in a dilated node of the neck. So these sentinel nodes are enlarged nodes that are above the clavicle and are first indications of malignant disease in the thorax and abdomen. And the enlarged nodes in the submandibular triangle, such as uh, tongue cancer, can be mistaken for an enlarged submandibular gland. So for correct identification of the nodes, it can be often made by bimanual palpation with one finger along the floor of the oral cavity. Then once they're being taken out during excision, the submandibular glands for a calculus or a tumor, um, then the mandibular and cervical branches of the facial nerve are going to be at risk. And finally, cutting the mandibular branch causes facial deformities because of the depressor anguli oris muscle being paralyzed. This concludes the segment on the oral cavity and the lymphatics.